Shabbat Shalom. We're going to go ahead and get started with our service because um, we were praying before the service, uh, and as soon as I we got done praying, came out of the room that we were praying in, and the uh, dessert table was right in front of my eyes. So this is going to be a quick service tonight because um, it looked awfully good. Um, but um, <clears throat> we want to welcome you to a Down Alum Messianic congregation. Uh, my name is Todd Lesser. I'll be leading the service this evening, and I'll be assisted by Randall Anderson. Uh, we like to point out that as a Messianic Jewish congregation, we are here to proclaim the Jewishness of our Messiah Yeshua and the Jewishness of our New Covenant faith. And one of the ways that we do that is by using Hebrew uh, in some of our songs and some of the prayers, but we will translate the Hebrew because we see ourselves as a community. Uh, we find in the scriptures that the Lord often uh, deals with the Jewish people, not individually, but as part of a community. And Rabbi Shaul, the Apostle Paul, in Ephesians chapter 2, talked about a community of the one new man, Jew and Gentile, uh, coming together to worship as one. We might even sing a song about that tonight. We'll have to see. Uh, but as we come together for this weekly divine appointment with the creator of the universe, we trust that this service will be a blessing to you. And we are going to begin our service in the traditional way. Our Jewish people, uh, the last thing they do actually before the Sabbath begins is have the lighting of the Sabbath candle. So I'm going, going to call up Janiel Scott uh, to uh, light the candles at this time. Often there are two candles because we are given two primary instructions regarding the Sabbath in the scriptures. We are told to shamor, to keep or guard the Sabbath, and to zachor, to remember the Sabbath, lakad shev, to keep it holy. Thank you, Janiel. We are also in a season, a time that the Lord established where we count the days between first fruits, which took place on the Saturday uh, evening following Passover and Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. Uh, it's traditionally called Sefirat HaOmer, which means the counting of the Omer. Omer is the Hebrew word for the sheaf that was to be brought to the priest at that time. So we're in the midst of the seven week period between Reshit HaKatsir, the first of the harvest, and Shavuot, the, first, uh, the feast of weeks. Uh, we find this instruction in Vayikra, Leviticus chapter 23, verses 15 and 16, which say, and you shall count unto you from the morrow after the day of rest, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the waving, seven weeks shall there be complete. Uh, even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number thy fifty days, and shall offer uh, and present a new meal offering, a mincha offering, unto the Lord. Uh, the seven week uh, count begins on the day following the, the uh, weekly Sabbath, and we're counting down to the 50th day, which is why this day is sometimes called Pentecost by some, from the Greek meaning 50th. So we will have a blessing, and then we will announce the next day in the count. Baruch Atadonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Hatzdekenu Al Yedeu Menah Yeshua HaMashiach. It's Ivanu al Sefirat HaOmer. Amen. Uh, which means, Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, 
who has justified us by faith in Yeshua the Messiah and commanded us regarding the counting following the waving of the sheep. Uh, next, we announce the next day in the count, Hayom, Ar ha uh, har Hayom Arba'a Asar Yamin Shehem Shavua Shanei Laomer, which means today is 14 days, which are two weeks of the seven week count from the waving of the sheaf. And in case you didn't follow that, we're displaying it graphically for uh, your understanding. Also, we'll mention that on our materials table, uh, we have some scriptures um, that are suggested to be read at this time, prayer topics uh, that you can uh, pray for during the time of the counting of the Omer. And so um, we're getting a little low on number, but you can always take your phone out, take a picture, and that way you'll have it with you. And uh, we might even print a few more um, before next week. Now I'm going to call up our cantor uh, and ask you to please stand for the uh, prayer known as the Shema. Uh, the prayer is taken from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. And in this prayer, once again, as a community, we affirm the oneness, the uniqueness of our God. Yeshua referred to the first line of the Shema as the greatest commandment. We'll chant the prayer in Hebrew and then recite the English translation followed by the verses that come afterwards in Deuteronomy 6, together the Shema. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Baruch Shem, Kevod Malchuto, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his glorious name, whose kingdom is forever and ever. Be ahafta eight Adonai Elohecha, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them upon the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Please join me in agreement as we open our service in prayer. Eloheinu veloheinu elohei Abraham elohei Yitzchak velohei Yaakov. Our God and God of our fathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. Lord, we just uh, thank you for this opportunity to gather together on this weekly divine appointment that you have established to meet with your people. And Lord, we are, have so many things to be thankful for that we take many of them for granted. Uh, Lord, we thank you uh, for the blessing of our new building that we are hopefully getting to the uh, end stages of finalizing the renovation. And we thank you for the workers that you have provided uh, to do much of the work so that we will be able to hopefully be in it in the next couple months or so. And Lord, we thank you for your favor as we uh, continue to try and obtain uh, some of the land that uh, is available next door. And so, uh, Lord, we thank you for that. But what the ultimate blessing that you have provided uh, was the sacrifice of your son. Uh, you offered him up so that we might have forgiveness for our sins. He willingly gave himself so that we might have a restored relationship with the creator of the universe. And so, Lord, we seek your anointing on this service, on the singing, on the dancing, the worship, the praise, the message, the liturgy, the fellowship, all that we do this evening, Lord, we dedicate it to you. We ask you to speak to the hearts of our Jewish people gathered in synagogues around the world, Lord, uh, particularly in Israel, Lord, that they would sense not only your presence, but your power to deliver their enemies into their hands, Lord. Uh, the miracle working power that if that's what it takes, you are able to perform the miracle to bring the hostages home safely. 
And Lord, we just pray for your blessing upon our land and our people, uh, that there would be an openness to uh, see the revelation that your son uh, is the promised Jewish Messiah for Israel and for all mankind. And Lord, for all who are here, I pray that eyes would be open to see, ears would be open to hear, and hearts would be open to receive, Lord. Revelation by your Ruach, by your spirit, for our lives tonight and for challenges that we may face in the days ahead. We dedicate this service to you. We ask you to use it for your purposes and for your glory. And we ask these things in our Messiah, Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated, and now I'm going to call up Rebecca Haberman to bring us our announcements for the week. Shabbat shalom, Shabbat shalom. and welcome to Adon Alam Messianic Congregation. If you're a first time visitor, please raise your hand so that we might recognize you. If you've not yet received a visitor's packet, please keep your hand raised so we'll get one to you. The packet contains brochures which tell you about our congregation and our services. You will also find a visitor's card which we would ask you to kindly fill out and place in the offering box next to the American flag after the service. Once again, we are blessed to have you with us this evening. This Tuesday, May 14, at 7.30 p.m., we will celebrate uh, Israeli Independence Day. We'll be talking about the spiritual significance of this day as we have described it as the greatest miracle of the past 1900 years. In accordance with the traditional observance, we'll start our service with the observance of Israeli Memorial Day, acknowledging the sacrifices that make the continued existence of the nation possible. We also want to encourage people to attend the MJAA National Conference in Grantham, PA, beginning on June 30th. The early registration discount is set to expire on May 31st. We have conference brochures available on the materials table. And now we pray the Lord's blessings upon you and hope that you'll feel his sweet spirit as you worship with us once again, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> now we will chant the traditional prayer known as the Bishamru, which means, and they shall keep. Uh, we will be chanting the Hebrew of Shemot, Exodus 31, verses 16 and 17. Then we will recite together the English translation with a Messianic paragraph that we have added at the end. Together, the Vishamru. Vishamru, Vanay Israel, Ed Hashabat, Rasod Ed Hashabat, Leather a Tambarillo.
together. The children of Israel shall keep the Shabbat to observe it throughout their generations as an everlasting covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he ceased from work and rested. And we know our Messiah Yeshua observed the Shabbat. In the New Covenant Scriptures we are told, as was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Amen. <clears throat> now uh, we want to uh, let you know about an observance that we do at this uh, time of the year because uh, we have had a new moon which signals the beginning of each month on the Hebrew calendar. Psalm 81 verse 3 says, Blow the shofar at the new moon, at the full moon, and on our feast day. So, <clears throat> one of the traditions that we do is to sound the shofar uh, at the first service that we have following the new moon. So I'm going to call up Jeremy Prelwitz uh, to sound a blast, and it will be a blast uh, on the sh shofar. Thank you, Jeremy. As part of our commemoration, uh, our congregation also marches our Torah scroll around the synagogue uh, at this service uh, that follows the new moon as well. So now I will call forward our ARC opener, Jeremy Keelan, uh, and also David Lewis, who will be marching the Torah, as well as our singers and dancers. And we would ask that as the ARC is opened, you would please stand. By way of information, we will tell you that the Torah is housed in a piece of furniture traditionally called the Ark, uh, which reminds us of the Ark of the Covenant, where the presence of the Lord dwelt. The Torah is a scroll of the first five books of the Bible, traditionally called the five books of Moses, and it is written on parchment that is made from the skin of kosher animals. The words are written by specially trained craftsmen known as sofarim, or scribes. And it takes about a year to scribe an entire Torah scroll, making them rather expensive. Not only that, if a mistake is made, the scroll is unusable until it is corrected. And if the mistake is made in writing the name of the Lord, the entire section must be scribed all over again. But that ensures that we have an accurate copy of God's word handed down to us over thousands of years. The Torah is covered with a decorative mantle to protect the parchment. Uh, and also there is a pointer called a yad, which is the Hebrew word for? Yes. Okay, the Hebrew lesson for tonight. No, we'll probably have more. Uh, this allows the reader to keep his place without touching the scroll, which over time will smear the ink and soil the parchment. We march the Torah around the congregation in a figure eight, encircling us with the word of God. Amen. We allow, That allows the Torah to pass by all of the aisle seats. Uh, and that is because it's customary to reach out with the fringes of the prayer shawl or a Bible or even your hand and touch the mantle and then bring... Uh, whatever you touched it with to your lips based on Psalm 119 verse 103 which says that the word is sweeter than honey to our mouths. If you want to touch the Torah as it passes just knock over anybody who's between you and the, uh, no, uh, make your way towards the aisle either one will uh, work and uh, you can also join in the march uh, and we would just encourage you if you want to do that to come and line up behind the dancers as we begin our Torah march.
Shabbat shalom, y'all. And it came to pass, whenever the ark went forward, Moses would say, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered. May those who hate you flee from before you. For from Sion shall go forth the Torah and the word of the Lord out of Jerusalem. Blessed be he who in holiness gave the Torah to his people Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Unique is our God, great is our Lord, holy and revered is his name. Magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and the earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom, and you are exalted as head over all. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mount, for the Lord our God is holy. Amen. I will now ask our scripture readers to come forward. He who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, May he bless David, son of Yeshua, and Linda, daughter of Yeshua, who have come up to honor God and his word. May the Holy One bless them and their families and send blessing and prosperity on all the work of their hands. And now for the blessing before the reading of the Torah. Bless the Lord who is blessed. Baruch Adonai Hamavarach Me'olam Bless the Lord who is blessed forever and ever. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Bachar Banu Mikol Hami V'natan Lanu Et Torato Baruch Atah Adonai Melotei Torah Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who chose us from all peoples and gave us the Torah. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. This is the third day of the second month on the Hebrew calendar, the month of Iyar. Our Torah reading for this evening is taken from Leviticus chapter 20, verses 22 to 26. In Hebrew, the name of the book is Vayikra. We'll be reading from chapter 20, verses 22 to 26, found on page 133, Complete Jewish Bible. You shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and perform them that that the land where I am bringing you to dwell may not vomit you out and you shall not walk in the statutes of the nations which I am casting out before you for they commit all these things and therefore I abhor them but I've said to you you shall inherit their land and I will give it to you to possess, a land flowing with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, who has separated you from the, from the peoples. You shall therefore distinguish between clean animals and unclean, between unclean birds and clean, and you shall not make yourselves abominable by beast or by bird or by any kind of living thing that creeps on the ground which I have separated from you as unclean. And you shall be holy to me, for I am the Lord, am holy, and have separated you from the peoples, that you should be mine. Amen. The blessing following the reading of the Torah. Baruch atah 
Eloheinu melech haolam, asher natan lana torat emet, v'chai olam natan betakenu, baruch ata alai, nevtein haTorah. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and life everlasting planted in our midst. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. And now for the congregational response following the reading of the Torah. Vizu HaTorah Asher Samboshe before the reading of the Haftarah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who chose good prophets, delighting in their words which were spoken truthfully. Blessed are you, O Lord, who chose the Torah, your servant Moshe, your people Israel, and the prophets of truth and righteousness. Amen. Amen. Our Haftarah portion for this evening is from Amos chapter 9, verses 13 through 15. In Hebrew, the name of the book is Amos Hanavi. We'll be reading from chapter 9, verses 13 through 15, found on page 741 in the Complete Jewish Bible. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him who sows seed. The mountain shall drip with sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. I will bring back the captives of my people Israel. They shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. I will plant them in their land, and no longer shall they be pulled up from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. Amen. The blessing following the reading of the Haftarah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, rock of all ages, righteous throughout all generations, you are the faithful God, promising and then performing, first speaking, then fulfilling, for all your words are true and righteous. Faithful are you, O Lord our God, and faithful are your words, for no word of yours shall remain unfulfilled. You are a faithful and merciful God and King. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, 
who are faithful in fulfilling your words. Amen. 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 <clears throat> and now the blessing before the reading of the New Covenant Scriptures. Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Natan Lanu Mashiach Yeshua, Bahadi Broshel HaBrit HaKadisha, Baruch Atah Adonai, Noten HaBrit HaKadisha, Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us Messiah Yeshua and the words of the renewed covenant. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the new covenant. Amen. Our Brit HaKadoshah portion for tonight is from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. In Hebrew, the name of the book is Kepha Aleph. We'll be reading from chapter 1, verses 13 through 16 found on page 1515 in the Complete Jewish Bible. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Amen. Amen. And now, the blessing following the reading of the New Covenant Scriptures. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, Asher natan lanu harabar haemet, Lechaye olam natan mitokinu, Baruch atah Adonai, Noten habrit hachashah. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the word of truth and life everlasting planted in our midst. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the renewed covenant. Amen. <clears throat> when the ark rested, Moses would say, Return, O Lord, to the myriads of Israel's families. Arise, O Lord, to your resting place, you and your mighty ark. Clothe your priest with righteousness. May those who have experienced your faithful love shout for joy. Hallelujah! For the sake of your servant David, do not delay the return of your Messiah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who gives us the living word and the Messiah Yeshua. Amen. Amen. When the ark is closed, y'all may be seated. Please join me in reciting, He being merciful. He being merciful forgives iniquity and does not destroy. Frequently he turns away his anger and does not stir up all his wrath. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving and exceedingly kind to all who call upon you. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The blood of Yeshua, our Messiah, cleanses us from all sin. Amen. Now I'm going to uh, dismiss all of the children 11 years old and younger to go to their class uh, as we ask the Lord to bless them in their study of uh, his revelation through the Torah portions, the same portions we will be talking about tonight. 
a lot of things going on in the congregation. First and foremost, last Tuesday, we commemorated Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day, a time of brutality toward our people that defies human understanding. And we find ourselves living in a time where many in this world through ignorance or outright anti-Semitism are sanctioning this type of brutality toward our people once again following the events of October 7th. Uh, I decided as we were uh, having our observance that what we really need to do is get um, people who are not Jewish but members of the community from the body of believers to be aware of these events and to see their uh, spiritual truths that are revealed through them. As many today question the right of the Jewish people to defend themselves against the terrorists who perpetrated these barbaric acts and still seek to wipe out the Jewish people. May God have mercy on our nation for any weakness that we may have displayed that would encourage Israel's enemies to feel like she is more vulnerable, for seemingly abandoning the Jewish state and the American and Israeli hostages to the whims of the terrorist group Hamas. As we've seen with recent events, much of the world today is quick to downplay or even ignore what true genocide is, what took place 80 years ago. And that is why we remember these events, why we mourn the victims, why we honor the heroes, those who survived and those who helped them, who were mostly Christians. But we also commemorate these events in the hope that they will never again be repeated. We remind the world of what took place so they won't forget the massive scar that impacts how many Jewish people view God, view uh, the, the world, and, and view Christianity today. Last week we were blessed to have Luke Hilton here. I hope that was a, a blessing to you all as, as he shared. Uh, he does the Israel Guys podcast. Uh, and he was uh, sharing with us what it is like to be living uh, in Israel these days. And this Tuesday, we will celebrate another uh, special time in the life of our people. One of the few good things that came out of the Holocaust, the reestablishment of the Jewish people in the land that God has given to them, Eretz Yisrael. Not only does the land of Israel provide a place of refuge for our people in an all too often hostile world, but it's a fulfillment of numerous prophecies from thousands of years ago, demonstrating that despite all of the craziness that we see in the world around us today, God is still in control, amen? amen. And he remains faithful to his promises and to his people. We're also, as I mentioned uh, a little bit earlier, continuing the renovation of our new building in our pursuit of the land next door. And I realized earlier this week regarding the land that we've made a generous offer. And there's really nothing more that we can do to improve our position. So at this point, we are simply trusting the Lord for a favorable outcome, as we've already experienced numerous times throughout this process. So let us just go to the Lord in prayer. Avinu Malkenu, our Father, our King. Lord, we pray for our people Israel. Lord, we pray for the safe return of the hostages. Uh, Lord, we pray uh, for the upcoming celebration as we realize uh, the uh, sacrifices that have been made to keep the nation of Israel in existence. But Lord, we pray right now that you would reveal truths from your words, that we might draw closer to you, that we might feel better equipped for the challenges that we may face in the days ahead. As uh, Lord, I just ask you to help me to speak the words that you would have me to speak, uh, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight, my rock and my redeemer, I ask it in Yeshua's name. Amen. <coughs> so we had a guest speaker last week, and that means we're going to talk about uh, both last week's and this week's uh, Torah portions. The first portion I will talk about, last week's portion, is called Achare Mo, which means after the death, uh, as the Lord gives instructions following the death 
of Aaron's two sons. The portion uh, is Leviticus chapter 16 through 18. And uh, in Leviticus 16, what do we find? Instructions for the holiest day of the year, Yom Kippur. In the Hebrew, it's called Yom Kippurim, the Day of Atonements. And there are several takeaways I want to mention from these instructions. Number one, this was the only day that the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies. In Vayikra Leviticus 16, verse 2, the Lord tells Moses that Aaron will die if he comes into the holiest place behind the curtain on any day other than Yom Kippur. And yet, as we often point out, Hebrews 4.16 tells us that as believers in Yeshua, we can draw near to the throne of grace with boldness. Not, not like the high priest who had a rope tied around him uh, and had to be thinking, Lord, I, I hope that I am doing things right. I hope that the sacrifice has taken care of my sins, but we can come with boldness so that we might receive mercy and find grace for help in our time of need. Number two, in Leviticus 16, verse 3, Aaron is told he has to bring that sin offering for himself and for his family before he is able to intercede on behalf of the children of Israel. And we contrast that with our Messiah Yeshua, who according to Hebrews 7, verse 27, he did not have to first offer up a sacrifice for his own sins because he never sinned when he walked this earth. He never sinned, period. His sacrifice of himself was not for himself, but was one time for all. Amen. Number three, this is a community event. This aspect of scripture is often misunderstood by many in the believing community today. Uh, primarily because uh, the promises that have been made to the Jewish people as a community are often interpreted as applying only to individual believers today. I'll give you an example. Isaiah 41 verse 10, you may be familiar with this. In the King James it says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. But what's interesting is we tend to ignore what it says two verses before that. In Isaiah 41, verse 8, it says, But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. I use the King James translation a lot because these are uh, um, terminology that is about the Lord blessing Israel. And if I read it from a Messianic translation, people will think that it's unique to the Messianic interpretation. But here, King Yaakov saw it the same way. His name is even in the verse. Uh, but the term Jacob is not referring to the king who wrote the Bible 400 years ago. I'm joking around. We're talking about King James, just in case <laughs> I didn't make that clear enough. The, thank you. The uh, term Jacob, also in the verse it says Israel, the seed of Abraham. In case we didn't get it clearly, there's a triple parallelism there as to who we're talking about. This is a blessing to the Jewish people in a community sense. So we find that Isaiah 41 verse 10 is not a promise of support from God for the individual believer. Perhaps it extends to that. But th these words are a promise of support from the Holy One of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to the Jewish people as a whole. So to understand it properly, it's important that we put the text into context. Let's say that together. Put the text into context. Point number four, atonement isn't simply the sins of the people being forgiven. The ritual described in Vayikra, Leviticus chapter 16, includes atonement for different parts of the tabernacle, the holy place, 
the tent of meeting, and the altar. Now, why does the tabernacle need atonement? According to Leviticus verse 16, it's because of the sins of the people. Now, how is the tabernacle atoned for? Leviticus 16 verse 15 says, the high priest is to sprinkle blood on the cover of the ark before and before the cover of the ark. The blood is what brings about the atonement. Sometimes blood can um, defile, as we saw in Exodus chap uh, Leviticus chapter 12, uh, when a woman gives birth, the blood that is a part of that process uh, has to be, uh, she has to go through a time of ritual purity afterwards. But here we see that the blood can cleanse. How do we know which one is which? By the context. We need to make sure that we put the text into context. Number five, the Leviticus 16 ritual involves two goats, uh, both of which picture the work of Yeshua. One of the goats, La Adonai, for the Lord, has its blood sprinkled on the ark cover. The other goat, often called the scapegoat, Azazel in the Hebrew, takes on, according to Leviticus 16 verse 21, all of the iniquities, all of the transgressions, and all of the sins of the children of Israel. Once again, we see a tripling to emphasize how significant this is. And then according to the next verse, the scapegoat is to be let go into the wilderness, um, <clears throat> although by Yeshua's time, they had modified the ritual slightly. To make sure that that goat that they had transferred all their sins onto didn't come wandering back into the camp. Uh, the ritual had been modified such that the goat was taken to a cliff and pushed off. Uh, that way we would be, make sure that we don't see our sins coming back towards us. Like the first goat, according to Hebrews 9 verse 12, Yeshua entered the holies on our behalf with his own blood. Like the second goat, Yeshua had our sins placed upon him. Isaiah 53 verse 6 says, We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. So Adonai has laid on him, the Lord has laid on him, on him, our iniquity, the iniquity of us all. We also find blood discussed in the next chapter, Leviticus 17. According to Leviticus 17, verse 10, the consumption of blood is prohibited for both the native born and the sojourner. Even though that screen says outsiders, it means the Hebrew word there is the Hebrew word we translate as sojourners. And I'll tell you more about that uh, as we talk about Leviticus uh, in 17, verse 11 and continuing. Uh, Leviticus 17 verse 11 says the soul of the flesh is in the blood. This is my translation of the, the Hebrew literally. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. And then in Leviticus 18 we find a list of inappropriate relationships that are forbidden to the Lord's people to distinguish them from the pagans that the Lord will drive out from before them. And I'm not going to go through all them all. If you want to look at them, you can just look at Leviticus 18 uh, in the following days. But in Leviticus 18, verse 28, I am going to talk about something it says there. One, uh, the people are told, uh, as we read earlier, uh, the idea the land will spit them out just as it has those before them if they follow the practices of the previous inhabitants. Uh, they didn't get a get out of jail free card when it came to worshiping the Lord. If they did the same things that were offensive to the Lord by the current inhabitants or the former inhabitants, they would get the same result. Now, the one thing that I want to point out concerning this portion Three different issues are addressed, and each of those issues, it is pointed out that it applies to both the native-born Israelite and the sojourner. 
who is sojourning in their midst. Leviticus 16, verse 29, we'll go through them, says that both the Israelite and the Ger Hagar, the sojourner sojourning among them, are to deny themselves and do no work on the Day of Atonements. And the prohibition against consuming blood in Leviticus 17, 10, as we just talked about, applies to any man from the house of Israel and to Hagar Hagar, the sojourner sojourning in their midst. And lastly, in Leviticus 18, verse 26, in these forbidden relationships, it says it applies to both the Israelite and Hagar Hagar, once again, the sojourner sojourning in their midst. So throughout the portion, the sojourner is included as a part of the community. Now, unfortunately, in some of the translations for the Hebrew word ger, we find foreigner or stranger or outsider or alien. And that keeps people from understanding the importance of the sojourner in the community of believers, even in the Jewish community. And as a result, some extend these requirements to all Gentiles rather than the specific case of the sojourner. So again, we see the importance of putting the text in context. And even as members of the Messianic community, even when we understand uh, the concept of the sojourner, the enemy's traps are still out there, traps of pride, or legalism. We can easily become prideful, thinking we're better than those who have fallen for the lie of replacement theology, the false theology based on the idea that all of the blessings that the Lord had promised to the Jewish people now belong to the church instead of the Jewish people. It's also easy to become legalistic about keeping Torah, but the scriptures reveal we do not obtain righteousness through Torah keeping. In James 2 verse 10 it says, whoever keeps the whole Torah but stumbles in one point, he's become guilty of all. That's all of us. We cannot achieve righteousness based on trying to keep the Torah. The way we achieve righteousness is described in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. Not through Torah keeping, it says, is through the sacrifice of Messiah Yeshua on our behalf. He made the one who knew no sin to become a sin offering for us. So that on our behalf, in him, we might become the righteousness of God. God sees us as righteous, not based on our own action, not based on whether or not we keep Torah. He sees us as righteous because of the work of Messiah Yeshua. And the Torah uh, for many of us is meaningful in our walk with the Lord. But that doesn't mean that, that we should start criticizing those who don't see things the way we do. In Ephesians 2.12, Paul describes the blessing of the Gentiles as a community as no longer being estranged from the, commonwealth of, from the commonwealth of Israel. In Ephesians 2, verse 15, Paul describes Jew and Gentile overcoming our cultural differences, enabling us to come together as the one new man, making shalom, peace. But the role of Torah in the life of the Gentile is a new experience, generally speaking, Unlike Jewish people who have been uh, raised hearing the Torah in the synagogue, this is something new that came along with faith in Messiah Yeshua and the revelation that we find in the New Covenant Scriptures. But in Acts 15, verse 10, Kepha, Peter, says that trying to keep the Torah can place a burden on the Gentiles that neither our, fa our fathers nor we have been able to bear. There are many who run around saying, you have to follow Torah, you have to follow Torah. I think Peter sees it differently, that the, the revelation of Torah is to be a blessing to us. We uh, follow Torah out of a desire to please our Heavenly Father, not because we have to. It's, a, <laughs> it's actually a greater blessing to choose to follow Torah 
than to feel like we have to do it. Now I want to talk about the Torah portion for this week in the few minutes I have left. Uh, it is called Kadoshim. Uh, Kadoshim is the plural of Kadosh, which means holy. Uh, in Leviticus 19, verse 2, the Lord tells Moses to speak to the congregation of the children of Israel, the congregation of B'nai Yisrael, telling them, you are to be Kadoshim, holy ones. Ki Kadosh Ani, because I am holy. Notice this instruction is not given to just the leaders. You know, there's this tendency to think that the congregational leader is the one setting the example. But we are all called to holiness, not even just the priests. We are all called to be priests, to intercede on behalf of our people, to intercede for those who uh, need healing from the Lord, who need a miracle, who just ask us to intercede on their behalf. Peter quotes Leviticus 19.2 and 1 Peter 1, verses 14 and 15, as we read earlier. He writes, like obedient children, do not be shaved, shaped by the cravings you had formerly in your ignorance. Instead, just like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in everything you do. Tonight, in these remaining minutes, we are going to seek an understanding of what it means to be holy. I think if you ask most believers today, are we supposed to be holy? The answer would be yes. And then if you asked, are you holy? The answer would probably again be yes. But what happens when we do something unholy? How do we become holy again? How do we know if we become unholy? One reason we struggle to understand holiness, I suspect, is because uh, I think many believers today confuse and conflate uh, righteousness and holiness. And we've already talked about righteousness and how that is accomplished, how that is obtained, how we are seen as righteous in God's sight. And there are similarities between righteousness and holiness, but there are also major differences. For example, do we ever find an inanimate object being described as righteous? No. But we do find them sometimes described as holy. Does anybody know the first time we find something described as holy in the Bible? You know, whenever something occurs for the first time, it's important to take note of that. And I have a feeling you're going to get the wrong answer, but go for it. The first thing that's ever called holy in the Bible is Shabbat. Yeah, that's what I, I figured you were going to say that. Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, because the Sabbath is not described holy until we get to Exodus. It's not, it, even though it's talked about as the seventh day and set apart, I couldn't find it. We'll see if you do. <laughs> <All right. laughs> anyway, um, <clears throat> but I was going to give you a clue, but uh, Chris has pointed out the first time we find the word kadosh uh, in the Hebrew scriptures is in Exodus 3.5, where Moses is told by the Lord he is standing on holy ground. And the reality is, uh, this ground is holy. Why? Go ahead. Genesis chapter 2, verse 3. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Yeah, we'll have to look at the, the Hebrew on that. Okay. that. That may well be right. Um, <clears throat> made it holy might be a slightly different form of the Hebrew that, that we didn't pick up on. And yes, like we're going to talk about the fact that Sabbath is indeed holy. So for the moment, a silver star. We'll see if it becomes gold or not. Um, <clears throat> but this actually illustrates the point I was about to make. The ground Moses is standing on is holy. Why? Because he's standing on ground that has the presence of God in it. There's a bush, right, that is burning and it is not consumed. That's the presence of the Lord. Now, here are other examples of holiness in the scripture. Uh, the Sabbath, parts of the tabernacle, the priest garments, 
and the oil used in the consecration of the priests. In Leviticus, it's primarily the Lord, his people, and the sanctuary. And also, even in this week's portion, in Leviticus 19, verse 24, uh, we talk about this on Tu Bishvat, the new year for trees. Uh, fruit from trees that are planted uh, are described as holy in the fourth year after they are planted. And in next week's portion, we will see the uh, divine appointments, the assemblies associated with the appointed times, described in Leviticus 23, verse 2, as Mikra e Kodesh, holy convocation, sacred assemblies. Uh, continuing in the scriptures, we will also find the following described as holy, the spirit of God, the land, and the Lord's mountain. Now the Hebrew word for holy, kadosh, has the idea of separation, distinctiveness, purity, something cleansed, or like God, without sin. Holiness means a person or place or thing becomes special because it, God has designated it to represent him in some way. Often something will be holy while the rest of the group is worldly, uh, ordinary. For example, the day we just talked about, the Shabbat is called holy. Now the other six days are not bad days, uh, it's just that they are not set apart as is the seventh day. Now, why is holiness such a difficult concept for us to grasp? Well, let me just share some of the challenges. We're called to be separated from this world, yet we are to engage this world to bring the message of Messiah Yeshua to those who don't know him, right? We're to go to Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth, as well as Jerusalem. Uh, <clears throat> We are called to be distinct, different from the nations. We even heard that uh, in the readings this evening, yet we are called to be one in Messiah, as we sang earlier. We're called to live lives of purity, even as we live in a fleshly, materialistic, pleasure-seeking, impure world. The blood of Yeshua cleanses us from all sin, yet we still struggle with the sinfulness of the flesh. We're called to be holy like God, yet disaster follows if we seek to become like God. Think of the garden and the Tower of Babel, for example. Perhaps in our efforts to be holy and remain holy, we find how easily we can become unholy, how easily we can be contaminated by the world, the flesh, and the devil. But this was not the case for Yeshua. This may be a reason that the whole concept of holiness uh, was established, or certainly one of the primary ones. When Yeshua walked the earth, the unholy did not make him unholy. He made the unholy holy. Think of when he cleansed the men of Sarah'at, often referred to as the cleansing of the lepers where he, instead of being contaminated by them, was able to say to them, be clean. Maybe tonight you need a cleansing from the Lord, a healing touch, so that you might be holy for him. Because tonight we've talked about the restoration of the Jewish people back in the land that God promised to them long ago. We've also talked about the restoration of the Jewish people through the Day of Atonements, the ritual that provided atonement for the tabernacle and for the Jewish people as a community. We've also seen how the sojourner is an integral part of the community, part of the commonwealth of Israel. And we've seen how both individually and as a community, Yeshua provided the sacrifice that brings forgiveness for sin, a sacrifice that is the only way that we can receive atonement, a sacrifice that we must accept as being offered up on our behalf individually. We've also seen that we can't do anything to bring about our own righteousness. The scripture describes our righteousnesses in Isaiah 64 verse six as being like filthy rags. It's only through Messiah's sacrifice on our behalf that we are able to be seen by the Lord as righteous. 
and he cleans us, not only uh, in terms of how we live, but he cleans us in terms of our motivation on the inside, in our hearts. So right now I'd like to ask, if you've never accepted Yeshua as your Messiah, but you are ready to receive the atonement that only he can provide with every head bowed and every eye closed, all you have to do is raise your hand to say yes to receiving that sacrifice on your behalf. Is there anyone? We always give this opportunity, knowing that many have raised their hands at various times, uh, that we all did that at one point, those of us who are followers of Messiah. And perhaps someone watching this out on the video, you realize you need the sacrifice that Messiah you, Yeshua provides. I would encourage you to um, just get in touch with us through uh, our email address or through um, the website or uh, even can text at the phone number. But for those of us who are already believers, perhaps you've stumbled recently in the areas of legalism and, and pride. You didn't even realize how easy it is to look down our nose at those who have a different understanding. How easy it is to fall into the trap of keeping Torah in an effort to be seen as righteous. Maybe those of us who are Jewish have not uh, had a good understanding of the importance of the sojourner in the community of Israel. Perhaps there are Gentiles who feel that they would fit in better in the Messianic community if only they were Jewish. We need to understand that God has given us a certain uh, calling and certain experiences and certain gifting for his purposes and our flesh is always saying but Lord there's still something that needs to be done before you can use me but the beauty of the message is that the Lord can use us just as we are and so um, if, if we're sojourning in the midst of the community, may we understand in a greater way the importance of our role. And if we're a part of this community, may we have a greater understanding of what it means uh, to have the one new man uh, established, primarily in Messianic synagogues. That's where we see Jews and Gentiles coming together. But maybe you didn't understand the difference between uh, trying to live a holy uh, life or being seen as righteous by your creator through the sacrifice of Messiah. But now you realize that God, God has called us to live a life that is holy. Uh, he's given us uh, numerous instructions, uh, what foods we are to eat and what uh, animals we are to stay away from uh, in terms of what we consume. Uh, <clears throat> what relationships are appropriate, what are inappropriate, how we are to treat one another. All of this comes down to his explanation that we are to be holy just as he is holy. So we can ask the Lord to replace with holy things the things of this world that we have allowed to defile us, that we can ask him to set us apart so that we might be used for his purposes. As Lord, we ask you to help us to understand our calling as a community, as your faithful servants, Jew and Gentile, Israelite and sojourner, one in Messiah. We ask you to help us to be led by your spirit, that we might better understand your truths as we live them out, that we might better avoid the fleshly snares of pride and legalism. And Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being a part of this end time work that you have called us to the restoration of your people back in the land and lord we realize that you are providing a, a new place for us to have our services that is uh, much closer to the jewish community of greenville and we believe lord that you are going to uh, use us uh, to bring that message to them the message of messiah yeshua as we seek a greater understanding, Lord, of your love, of your grace, of your holiness. We thank you that you are the faithful God, that you are keeping and will always keep your promises to the Jewish people, which is what gives us confidence 
that any promises that you have made to the nations or to the body of believers, uh, we see in that example that you will be faithful to those promises as well. Lord, I ask you to change hearts and lives to be more conformed to the image of your son as we press forward toward the mark of the high calling in Messiah Yeshua. And we ask all these things in the name above every name, in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, and everyone said, amen, amen and amen. God bless you all. Thank you all for coming. Thanks to all who had a part in our service. Now I'm going to call our cantor back up to say the traditional blessings that are chanted at the end of the Sabbath service. We can even uh, chant them along with him if we know them. And uh, remember this Tuesday, we will be celebrating and uh, encourage everyone to join us uh, as you will learn a great deal about uh, the day on the Hebrew calendar and the day on the English calendar when the nation of Israel came back into existence after thousands of years. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who created the fruit of the vine. Amen. 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 And we say Lachayim, which means to life, because Tevye said it in Fiddler on the Roof. It's good enough for Tevye, good enough for me. Also, the Lord says, I set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life that you and your descendants may live. Baruch Blessed are you, Lord our God, God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread, bread and all manner of food from the earth. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Fred, for not only being our cantor this evening, but also uh, doing such a great job of overseeing the renovation effort. Uh, prim the primary three that are doing that are um, Fred with his experience, Mick uh, is our boot on the ground, as they say. Uh, he's, he's there regularly watching the men do the work. And uh, my wife, Sarah Lesser, is greatly involved in all of those little design, design decisions that have to be made along the way. Now I would ask everyone to please stand as we are going to pronounce the blessing found in Numbers chapter 6. These words of blessing come right out of the scriptures and are the Lord's words of blessing that he told Moshe, Moses, to have his brother Aharon, Aaron, as the first Kohen Gadol, as the first high priest, to pronounce these words over his people we encourage you to stand and receive these words of blessing from the Lord this evening. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and may he grant unto you his peace. Amen. Uh, we're going to have a closing song, but I want to mention Philip uh, wrote a book on the Sabbath that we sell uh, or make available through our gift shop. Uh, and so I knew that that's what he was going to um, say. And it just shows that you have to constantly be researching uh, because uh, when I looked up the Strong's number for Kadosh, it wasn't there. But I'm guessing I'm going to look at Genesis 2 verse 3 and I'm going to see a form of that word. Um, yeah. <clears throat> now we are going to sing the Ein Kelohenu. As I often point out, I sang this in the synagogue growing up, but only in the Hebrew. So I knew the words, but I had no idea what they meant. But we're going to sing it in the Hebrew and the English, so you'll know what you've just sung. Ein Kelohenu, there is no one like our God.
Shabbat Shalom. See you on Tuesday.